beginning of the 15th century had been highly eventful for Mehmet and the Turks for the Ottoman Sultanate. Starting off with a crusade and two sieges of Constantinople, a civil war and the invasion of Timur, the years would prove pivotal to the history of not only Europe, but the world. Much of Mehmet's father's reign, Murad II, was spent regaining lost land and destroying rivals and revolts throughout the realm. Murad II abdicated his throne to his son, much like Diocletian of Rome many years before, to live a peaceful life after stabilizing the realm. However, Mehmet's age and inexperience led the Janissaries to depose him in favor of Murad in the face of an incoming crusade. While Murad decisively crashed the crusade, Mehmet still spent much of his time in exile. During his forced exile in Magnesia, he prepared a detailed plan to deal with the politicized and unruly elements within the military. After his reinstatement to the throne, he immediately sacked the key military commanders, including the Allah of the Janissaries, the Kazanji Doan, and the appointed trusted lieutenants to these positions. He needed a strength in his house, and this was a sure way of providing that. Not to mention, it was a certain type of revenge that drove them to these actions. His next step was to enforce a wide-scale disciplinary measures and harsh punishments. But even these measures did not satisfy him. To effectively control the Janissary Corps more completely, and to ensure their loyalty, he reorganized their organizational structure and introduced the largest palace guard unit, the Sekban, or the Hound Keepers, into the corps. The Sekbans became an integral part of the corps and in a short time, but at the same time preserved their separate identity and name. After introducing the palace guard into the Kapukula effectively, diluting their political strength of the Janissaries, he turned his attention to the artillery. Mehmet knew the first two sieges failed because they lacked large and effective cannons. Without these, there was no way of bringing down the massive walls of the city. The siege in 1402 failed because the lack of cannon forced his grandfather to try and starve the city out. This was long and costly, and however likely it was to succeed, the first siege failed. Any external attack over the many year long siege would force Mehmet to break and withdraw, such as the invasion of Timur or the Crusade of Varna, or an internal issue such as, a second, such as in the Second Siege of 1411. Mehmet knew he had little time to conduct the attack, and the walls had to be brought down as quickly as possible. His fascination with military technology was instrumental in the foundation of the artillery corps, which previously was an ad hoc Timariat unit with a very loose organizational structure. He first turned the artillery into salutary standing army units, which allowed him to deploy quickly to distant positions. To modernize the artillery, he employed European cannon founders and technicians like the legendary Hungarian master Orban, and he also mobilized all available local military technicians, craftsmen, and gunsmiths. Edina, or Adrianople, became a large foundry locus where various groups of founders and technicians refined their designs under the personal supervision of Mehmet himself. His newly reorganized artillery batteries tested these new cannons as part of the continuous training program. Unfortunately, the details of the artillery reorganization and preparation for siege operations, including the gunpowder and saltpeter industries, remain unclear. But we do know at least four giant bombards, bigger than 40 centimeters in diameter, and about 74 medium cannons were produced and organized into 14 siege and four fortress artillery batteries. There were also an estimated 15 more field batteries equipped with light wrought iron pieces. Mehmet knew to achieve Istanbul as his prize, he needed a strong navy. Establishing naval supremacy needed more effort and time, and he built more than 100 naval vessels, the bulk of which came from the Gallipoli dockyards. But interestingly, most of them were small vessels, and only 20 of them were galleys. There were no galleons or other types of large vessels, as far as we can understand from available data. The probable reasons behind not constructing large ships were a lack of know-how and limited numbers of experienced captains and trained crew. In fact, nearly all of Mehmet's captains and crew were the legacies of various maritime Turkoman emirates, and the experiences 
were with the piracy, not naval warfare, like the Byzantines. To compensate for these limitations, Mehmet assigned one of his trusted lieutenants from his royal household, Balta Ola Suleiman Bey, as the admiral of the navy. However, his preference for royalty this time, rather than experience, proved instrumental in the failure of the navy during the siege. After the conquest of Istanbul, which I will most probably not get into since it has been covered many, many times in other TV shows, movies, and YouTube channels. Mehmet continued his reorganization of the Janissaries. He replaced the old military scribes who were raised within the corps with civilian scribes, independent of the corps hierarchy, to prepare muster lists with all the details of individual soldiers were kept. This kept financial spending in the hands of Mehmet and the government. He moved the main Janissary barracks from the city of Edina and founded a new Ajemi Ojar, or training hearth, in addition to the one in Gallipoli. The Istanbul Ajemi Ojar became the biggest Janissary military training institution in a short time, reaching a strength of 3,000 to 4,000 men organized into 31 Odars or companies. Although the original strength of the training period, 8 to 9 years, was preserved, in reality, due to the constant nature of campaigns, and the increasing number of assignments to the provinces, the turnover rate of soldiers was very high. While the Devshunma system became the main source of Janissaries and other corps, the practice of selecting youth just after the conquest of large towns was continued. Mehmet II was especially keen on carrying out the selection himself. Also beginning with Mehmet II, the Janissaries were tasked to guard important fortresses for periods of the three years in a row. Mehmet's changes were also focused on the prestigious household cavalry. During the military reorganization of Mehmet II, the force gained its permanent character and organization. The Sipa became the most prestigious regiment, followed by the others. And at the same time, the recruitment policy changed drastically, and the sons of nobles were taken out of the recruitment pool. Mehmet introduced merit, valor, and loyalty as the guiding career criteria for enlistment. Pages of the palace school and use from other royal schools were assigned according to their talent, merit and age to the first two regiments of the Kapukula Sivari. Meritorious and veteran genocities were assigned also to the first four regiments as an award which amazed contemporary rest and observers. Mehmet also founded two of the three technical branches of the Kapukula. The most important technical branch was the artillery. The most important technical branch after the artillery, without a doubt, was the Jebeji Orja, or the hearth of the armorers. The main duty of the Jebejis was to manufacture weapons, including the firearms, armor, and trenching tools, and related combat equipment of the Janissaries. At the same time, they were responsible to fix and repair broken equipment and store them during peacetime. As a general rule, all weapons and armor remain in depots under properly controlled conditions during peacetime. Janissaries were not allowed to use these equipments except on campaigns or for designated training. The Jebejis carefully issued weapons, armor, and ammunition, 300 rounds for a musket and other equipments to each soldier before battles and collected them after battles. The Jebejis always transported, transported these equipments themselves back and forth with special wagons. And interestingly, even the Janissaries did not get their weapons and equipment into reaching the combat zone. Within the system, firearms receive special priority. Obviously, by issuing weapons only during actual combat or special training, the government attempted to keep the arsenal in proper condition and, and more importantly, stop any loss or theft or uncontrolled diffusion of weapons to unauthorized persons. The last technical corps which was founded by Mehmet was the Lamja Oja, the heart of the miners. Originally, this corps was found to provide engineering support for siege operations during the reign of Mehmet II. The main task of the Lamjas was to dig mines under the enemy walls and to place explosives there and to ignite them at proper times. They also performed counter mining operations and a unit of miners was always present in the forces assigned to every important fortress. Additionally, they were responsible for field duties as sappers and dug trenches gunnery positions, and other other works for siege operations. The final reform, and one of the most important, important reforms of Mehmet, was the Timari landholder system. The Timari cavalry gained its distinctive character after the wild-scale reforms of Mehmet, who removed hereditary local magnates from the military and took over their private estates. 
He also reorganized the organizational structure of the cavalry and introduced various control mechanisms. Even though his son Bezard had to return some of his confiscated lands, most of Mehmet's regulations remained and were reinforced during Suleiman's rule, leading to a more effective Timuria system. Mehmet's reforms not only enabled him to conquer Istanbul, but set him and the Ottoman Empire apart as one of the most dominant forces of Europe. It's obvious without the changes to the Ottoman military, the period that followed him would not be the pinnacle of a and the apex of Ottoman military expansionism.